Hi class! In today's lesson, you will learn about transport across cell membranes. So if you think about all the different things that each cell needs to be able to do, there's various kinds of uh, molecules that both need to get into a cell or out of a cell for the cell to be able to function. So in this lesson, we will focus on, uh, on transport across this external membrane, the plasma membrane. But remember, there are also internal membranes inside the cell that, uh, that also need to transport molecules across. Now to remind you, cell membranes are selectively permeable, meaning that certain molecules can get across, but others cannot. Now I'm assuming that you remember the structure of a plasma membrane. This picture is fairly detailed. Um, if you don't remember all the components, that's okay. The part that is most crucial for this lesson is this one, the phospholipid bilayer and the transmembrane proteins that span the bilayer. So before we begin, let me give you an outline of the types of transport that I will address. So first I'll discuss the transport of small solutes and water. Uh, this can be categorized into either passive transport or active transport. And then passive transport can further be split into these two categories, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion. In a previous lesson, you already learned about osmosis, which is the diffusion of water. For the most part, osmosis falls under facilitated diffusion. And then towards the end of the lesson, I'll also address bulk transport, which is done through either endocytosis or exocytosis. And then endocytosis has a few different types under, uh, within it also. Okay, so the first type of transport that we will focus on is simple diffusion, which is a type of passive transport. A simple diffusion occurs when molecules move directly between the phospholipids as is shown in this picture. Their movement, they have a net movement down their concentration gradient, as in they move from high concentration to low concentration. So in this picture, you can see initially there's uh, all of the molecules start out on one side of the membrane. It doesn't matter whether it's inside the cell or outside the cell, just that there's a high concentration on one side and there's net movement from high concentration to low concentration, and eventually they may reach equilibrium when there's an equal concentration on both sides. Now, you already learned about diffusion before, so I'd like to ask you, do you remember what net movement means? We'll discuss it in class. And so this type of transport does not require an energy input, because it doesn't require energy, that's why it's called passive. Now, what kind of molecules can use simple diffusion? Well, this chart summarizes um, the permeability of the membrane to different categories of molecules. So cell membranes are highly permeable to small nonpolar molecules, such as carbon dioxide and oxygen. They're slightly permeable to small polar molecules, such as water and to a lesser extent glucose. And they're not at all permeable to ions and very large molecules. So ions such as sodium and potassium, they're pretty tiny. They're even smaller um, than carbon dioxide, but they cannot move across the membrane. And proteins, which are very large, also cannot. So before moving on, I'd like to ask you a question. Based on what you remember about the structure of the cell membranes, why are they most permeable to only small and nonpolar molecules? So write the answer down. We'll discuss it in class. So before we move on, this is the final summary of simple diffusion. So remember, simple diffusion is for small nonpolar molecules they move directly between the phospholipids, they're moving down their concentration gradient, and this type of transport does not require an energy input. So how do other types of molecules, ones that aren't small and nonpolar, get into or out of cells? Well, we will now discuss 
facilitated diffusion, which is also a type of passive transport. And this one is for movement of molecules that are either large or polar or charged ions. They don't have to be all of these, but if they're either too big or polar or charged, they can't use simple diffusion. And so facilitated diffusion is how they can get across the membrane. So think about what does the word facilitate means? To facilitate means to help something along, right? So this is a diffusion which is facilitated with the help of a transport protein. So those transmembrane proteins that you learned about earlier, some of them, not all, but some of them function as channels that allow molecules to move across. Now, this transport protein has to be specific to the molecule that's being transported. So you have specific transporters for glucose or for sodium ions or for potassium ions and so on. And the special interactions between the amino acids that line the inside of this channel will determine what kind of solute can get through. This is still diffusion, so it's still net movement down the concentration gradient, so from high to low, and it still does not require energy input. And now I'd like to come back to something you learned about in a previous lesson to give you a little more information. So you had learned that osmosis is the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Now, if that membrane is an artificial membrane, then the water molecules can diffuse across simply by moving through the little pores in that artificial membrane. But what if it's a real cell membrane? Well, water molecules are small, but they're polar, which means they have a rough time moving directly between the phospholipids through simple diffusion. A small minority of water molecules can get across through simple diffusion, but the great majority use facilitated diffusion. So water requires a protein channel called aquaporin to get into and out of our cells. And here's a simplified picture of what aquaporin looks like. And the scientists that discovered aquaporin actually won a Nobel Prize in medicine because the function of this aquaporin is very important to your health. Now, before I move on to talking about active transport, I'd like to give you a couple more details about facilitated diffusion. So in some cases, that transport protein is a simple channel that just passively allows solutes to move through. But in other cases, it is a carrier protein that changes shape as the solute moves through. In other cases, facilitated diffusion can use what's called a gated channel that can actually open and close to allow solutes to move through at the right time. It doesn't actually have a ball and chain like shown in this picture, but this protein um, does have some amino acids here that can close the channel and then the, the protein changes shape to open the channel at just the right time. And a wide variety of signals determine whether that uh, gate is open and closed. The one shown in this particular picture is actually functions in your nervous system and this gated channel opens when the electrical charge inside the cell changes. And now let's talk about active transport. The purpose of active transport is to pump molecules against their concentration gradient, as in from low concentration to high concentration. Just like facilitated diffusion, active transport requires a transport protein so in this case, it's often called a protein pump. This transport protein or this protein pump has to be specific to the molecule being transported. And in this picture, what you're seeing is an example of one protein pump called the sodium potassium pump. And this one is crucial in the function of your nervous system. It transports sodium ions out of the cell 
from low concentration to build up a high concentration outside of the cell. And at the same time, it also transports potassium ions into the cell, again, from low concentration to high concentration. And the purpose is that the cell needs to build up a high concentration of potassium inside and a high concentration of sodium on the outside. This type of transport requires an energy input. So simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion were both called passive transport because they did not require an energy input, but active transport does. And often that energy comes from the hydrolysis of ATP where that terminal phosphate group is broken off. So now let's summarize what you learned so far. So we talked about the transport of small solutes and water using two different categories of passive transport, simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, with osmosis being a specialized case of facilitated diffusion. And then I told you a little bit about active transport. So now we're gonna move on to bulk transport. Bulk transport occurs when cells need to move either very large particles or larger quantities of particles into or out of cells. And so we'll discuss endocytosis versus exocytosis. And within endocytosis, I'll tell you about two different types. These are not the only types, but the ones that we will focus on. So exocytosis occurs when molecules are transported out of the cell using vesicles. So in this picture, you can see a vesicle with some dissolved molecules inside delivers those molecules to the plasma membrane. The membrane of the vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane and thus releasing its contents out of the cell. Here's a cool example of exocytosis happening in your body, in your pancreas. So this shows um, pancreatic cells and all those little black dots are vesicles. Your pancreatic cells are producing large quantities of digestive enzymes that they need to release for, them to then, for those enzymes to then be delivered to your small intestine. So there's constant exocytosis happening in your pancreas. Now, endocytosis occurs when molecules or even larger particles enter a cell using a vesicle, sometimes referred to as an endosome. Now, there are three types of endocytosis, but I will only tell you about two of them. So, pinocytosis is sometimes referred to as cellular drinking. That's when the plasma membrane kind of folds inward and then pinches off to form a vesicle. And that vesicle will now contain a small amounts of fluid that was initially found outside of the cell, and there will be uh, dissolved molecules inside that fluid. Phagocytosis occurs when cells engulf large particles, which can sometimes be entire bacterial cells. Now, in your body, you have one type of cell that can do phagocytosis, and th that's a special type of white blood cell that functions in your immune system. This is how your white blood cells help to defend you against bacterial infections. They literally engulf those bacteria and then digest them to destroy them. And here's a really cool microscope image of a real white blood cell caught in the act of engulfing a bacterial cell. So this is the end of the lesson. So here's our summary. You first learn about the transport of small solutes and water through two types of passive transport. And then you learn about active transport. And then finally, we talked about two different forms of bulk transport, endocytosis versus exocytosis, which both use vesicles. So that's the end of the lesson.